And welcome everybody to our third uh, virtual Lunch in the Forest series today on parenting and forestry. My name is Hisham Zarifi. I am an associate professor in forest resources management in the Faculty of Forestry and the uh, chair of the Equity, Inclusion and Diversity Council of the Faculty of Forestry. And on behalf of the council and the faculty um, and the associate dean of EDI, who is also on this call, um, I welcome you to our uh, lunch series. I would like to start by acknowledging that uh, I personally am right now on the um, Vancouver uh, Point Grey campus uh, of UBC, which means I am on the unceded traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam people. UBC, of course, also is on the uh, territories of the Squamish and the Salatooth nations. Um, I don't know where you're joining us from, but uh, wherever you are joining us from, if it's not in the Vancouver area, I do encourage you to look at the nativelands.ca website and see whose um, territories you are on. Um, I'm really excited about today's uh, topic, um, speaking as a parent in forestry, um, and uh, really uh, looking forward to seeing what our three speakers have to say about that topic. Uh, a few housekeeping items. You will see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button and a chat button. We would like you please to use the Q&A button to ask any questions you may have or pose any comments you may have and not the chat function as we will be using that to help moderate um, the, the talk on behalf of our host today who is the wonderful Estefania Mia Moreno, uh, who's been hosting all of these and organizing all of these. And uh, I thank her very much for all of her hard work. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Estefania. Thank you so much, Hisham. Um, today's webinar will allow us to explore different experiences of parents in the Faculty of Forestry, but I'm sure their stories will resonate beyond the faculty. For many, parenting has not been a possibility. For others, it's not an option, but, but an obligation or something that is socially imposed. We invite all of you to reflect on the complexities around this topic and acknowledge that there is no unique family structure. To speak about this topic, we are honored to have Dr. Faride Unda, PhD student Amanda Johnson, and PhD candidate Neftali Hernandez. Faride is originally from Ecuador, where she studied her undergrad in agricultural sciences and then came to UBC to pursue her graduate degree in plant biology. Her research is focused on the biosynthetic pathways for cellulose and lignin formation with the aim of improving industrial processing of for bioenergy. Amanda Johnson is a PhD student in the Department of Wood Science. She works in the lab developing plant-based plastics. Recently, she has been working to test the biodegradation and ecotoxicity of various bioplastic formulations. And last but not least, Neftali Hernandez is a forest engineer from Mexico. Currently, he's a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Forestry, working in topics of reduction of emission from deforestation and forest degradation. Neftali has been living and working with Zapotec indigenous communities in Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, how is everybody doing? Very good, thank you. Good. Thank you for inviting us. Great. Um, we are gathering around lunchtime, and for that reason, um, I, we would like to know what is your favorite dish. So I can start. Um, like on a weekend, I would like to have a ceviche. <laughs> but on weekdays, usually, like I'm good with like some soup and a sandwich. Yeah, I like sandwiches and soup too. As long as it's, there's a hot beverage as well. Tea or coffee. Yeah, for myself, I like any kind of soup at uh, lunchtime. I prefer lunch over sandwiches or anything else and especially if it has some kind of fish on it. <laughs> Perfect, thank you for sharing that. So um, we're gonna start with um, sharing this picture and I would like to invite this gift. 
Faride uh, to tell us a little bit more about this. The question that I raised and that I invited them uh, to reflect on was in one image or one gift that will um, resonate on how is parenting for them. So Faride, we hear you. Okay, thank you very much, Estefania, for the invitation. And thank you for the equity, inclusion, and diversity team for having this space for communication and discussion about other topics more than science. So I chose this picture because it's not an static image. It's, um, it's a balancing act. So I feel like parenting is something like that. So I'm going to tell you a bit about my story, but I want to say that there is no right or wrong way to do it. Each family travel their own journey. So for me, I came to Canada and started my master's degree already with a four-year-old daughter. And then I passed my comprehensive uh, five months pregnant with my son. So that gave me a little bit of advantage between them, like I have nine years apart, to readjust a little bit about parenting too. But this picture what represents is never gonna be like a perfect straight line. There is a constant readjustment there is some days and some weekends that I had more time when I, when I was in grad school to be with my kids. But there was also like very long days in the lab or like in the office when I was studying for my comprehensive or writing my thesis. So that's what I feel. But I think I was very, very lucky to have a great support system. So first, my husband was a great partner uh, uh, that complement our like parenting. And I also was very lucky to find at the student housing an incredible uh, group of Latino families, which act as my extended family. So I was very, very lucky to find those Latino mamas to help me through this. Thank you, Faride. And now I would like to invite uh, Amanda to tell us about this picture. Yeah, sure. So this picture is a painting by J.E.H. McDonald. And I wanted to, I chose it because uh, I think it represents a little bit of being a parent and a grad student at the same time. So put on your art critic hats and look at it for a second while I, I tell you about myself. So I'm like as Stephanie has said, I'm five years into my PhD and I had a baby when I was three years into my PhD. So I had this experience of becoming a new parent during my PhD. So it's been an adventure. And looking at it from the lens of equity, diversity and inclusion, I can think of two major challenges that uh, I've had. So now coming back to the painting, it's a picture of a garden. It's called the Tangled Garden. And while it shows flowers, it doesn't just show the, the, the prettiness of the flowers. You've got the whole picture, which is there are sunflowers withering and drying out and bending. And so instead of depicting the ideal flower, uh, this painting depicts reality which is this uh, kind of out of control, um, messy thing that is also beautiful. So to use it as an analogy to my graduate school experience as a parent, I would say that um, managing expectations is very important and you can't go for perfection all the time because reality is, is messy. So, um, yeah, I think that's one thing that I've, I've come to, to realize as a parent. And the other thing I've come to realize is like Faride was saying this, a balance between my personal life and my PhD. And once you find the balance, life becomes very fulfilling and it becomes, 
that's incredibly motivating. And, you know, I feel so grateful that I have the opportunity to do a PhD and be a mother at the same time. So um, I've got to say that I'm, I've, I've never been happier. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a parent and I'm a PhD student. So if I had a message to tell everybody, it would just be that you can do it. I did it. You can do it. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the rest of this discussion, but uh, that's one, what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. And we will check the last picture and then we will start uh, talking a little bit more broadly. Neftali, please share with us yeah. why this picture. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Um, I'm talking to you right now from Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, my experience, it's been a little bit different because most of the time I've been moving from Vancouver to Mexico and uh, because I've been working with uh, indigenous people here also. Uh, so my family has to stay here most of the time. My uh, wife, she's an elementary school teacher. We have three kids. Uh, the oldest is uh, nine year old and uh, the second is uh, six year old and the third is uh, almost three year old now. So uh, it's been a lot happening in our lives, especially during this year. It's been a tough year because um, in my case, like my mother died this year and uh, this changes a lot of the things that happen in, in our lives. And, um, but basically what, what I wanna share to you is uh, that even uh, some tragedies or these catastrophic things happen in our lives, that's life and that's normal uh, to all of us. Um, and we have to think or rethink many times, like what is the best routine for our lives? And uh, we do this thing with uh, my wife, uh, like every night or every week, we take a cup of coffee and we sit down and we talk about what, in, what is working and what is not working in our, in our house, in our home. And um, I like um, a six step method that I looked at a website that is called Biz Life Tech. Um, and it talks about defining your, your goals. Um, as a family, we always have goals and these have to be uh, realistic, but also optimistic. And um, I like to see more like reachable goals when you have to th uh, think or rethink when you have to organize also your goals as a family and also as a person in the academia. So when we talk about rethinking things, we have to include uh, basically a schedule for uh, my wife, for me, and for the kids, and basically ask who's gonna work with whom and uh, in a normal day. So uh, we have to change sometimes many things, like basically, for example, this year, we changed it to like the spaces where we work and we have to avoid like noise, we have to get some more privacy, clean rooms and wake up early, do some exercise, get a shower and a good breakfast to prepare for, for the day. So this is, I imagine that something that all of you do, but if you have a method on how to redefine your, your goals every day, I think that's something that helps a lot. And um, we have to write down our, our schedule and make some changes like every week to see uh, if we have if we, if we can improve our productivity as students, but also as parents with our kids. And um, yes, so from my experience, I will say that it's something that helped us to change. Um, even for me, I, I, I will say that uh, when I uh, started my family, I had some um, expectations. I had some paradigms that I been able to change over the years and not to see that I'm helping my wife, but to see that it's also my responsibility as a parent to do uh, an equal amount of uh, uh, the things that we have to have done at home. So um, yeah, that, that will be my experience.
Thank you so much, Nectali. I will stop sharing uh, so we can all see your faces. Um, perfect. And yeah, well, it's very interesting to hear all of your experiences. I think that I would like uh, to note that Faria has two, well, they're not children anymore, I think. Um, but you have uh, kind of in, a, in, in the oldest uh, spectrum of, do you want to share, uh, Fari? Uh, maybe I can invite all of you to share a little bit more about the ages so people can target the questions in having that in mind. Okay, so I have a 21-year-old daughter, third year at UBCO, and I have a 12-year-old son, so he's still with me. Um, and that's what I was saying, that gave me a little bit of advantage. So I had nine years to rethink some of the rules. <laughs> and even though sometimes my daughter thinks that, like, I let Alejandro do whatever he wants because I was a bit more strict with her. It was also very difficult um, coming from another culture and not having my mom to guide me or my family to guide me. Um, and being a different like health system, education system, you always feel a little bit more pressure to perform. So, but I think, well, also because he's a second child, you get a little bit more relaxed, but also we've been living here in Canada for 18 years. So now we feel as part of this country. And that's another thing that I'm very grateful is uh, living in this country too. Uh, so my daughter is two. So I feel like I don't, I'm still getting used to everything about having a parent, <laughs> being a parent rather. Yeah, in my case, I already told you, I have a nine years old, a six year old girl. I have two girls, the first two ones. And um, my third is a boy of almost three years now. And uh, many of the things have changed because I remember we took our uh, first daughter to see the uh, the doctor like every every month for a you know, general review. But um, we're seeing now our third boy is just like, um, if only he, if he gets sick, then we were gonna think to take him to, the, to see the doctor, right? Thank you so much. Um, everyone. Um, I have a few questions that I'd like to, to share with you. Um, please feel free to, to respond to them. Um, I prefer that you decide who's going to take that and then the others might follow. Um, so the first one that I have is that under the highly challenging circumstances of the pandemic, many scholars are struggling to do their work. Many struggle to find the boundaries between work and home prior to COVID, uh, and now it's even more challenging. Burnout is a real issue. Women in particular have been negatively impacted, especially women of color. Um, so do you, how, how have you navigated this? Uh, do you have any, any thoughts around this? Maybe I can start. So I feel, um uh, even though all of the financial and um, anxiety that came with this pandemic i was lucky enough first to have like already like big kids right like i had the time to work if i had to work like from home but i also feel it was a little bit of a break for our family because we were always in a rush always from school to sports to dinner and then repeat, repeat, repeat. So I felt that this time gave me the opportunity to spend all the time with my kids. And one thing that made me very happy, for example, is that my daughter came back because she's been living in Kelowna for two and a half years and now she's here with me. So that makes me very happy. But also I feel that I get to know even my son much more. Like, uh, I know it's a lot of, like it is always your work is in your mind, but um, 
thankfully I live I live on campus. I had a little bit of like I had to go to work because we have to keep up with the plan, so I have an, an exemption. But still, it was a little bit more time than usual for me to share with my son. So maybe with little kids that would be very different. But uh, for me, it was a break time. Thank you, Fadi. Yeah, I like the extra time that I could spend with my two-year-old. Um, it was funny. I guess one funny story I can tell was um, they were having a virtual conference that I was I was going to, and there was no one to look after my two-year-old. And two-year-olds are tornadoes, so I, I knew what I had to do to get her to stay occupied for an hour. I needed an hour, so I gave her an open bottle of uh, popcorn kernels unpopped and in the next hour she had put them all over the house but she was occupied and that's what I needed to want to go to my conference and watch my presentation uh, so yeah uh, we <laughs> the house got really messy at times um, but I think it's okay I, I was also glad to have uh, have more time with my two-year-old amazing thank you Amanda yeah, I was going to say, uh, Stefania, also that something that uh, has helped us, like, um, we're lucky to have some uh, income by uh, teaching from home in the case of my wife, but also our kids, um, as they are growing, they're learning what are the tasks at home that they have to have done on time. Uh, and, and this is regardless of uh, if they're at home or they have to go somewhere else. And um, also we have to learn like how to have like enough support for each other to have some tolerance for each other. Take some time and go outside when you're feeling like uh, with a lot of stress. And uh, we're lucky to live uh, outside of the urban area. So uh, we have like enough space to run and take the bikes. and. So I think it's not like everybody's situation, but I think that you have to look for options because uh, uh, somebody um, that just stays you know, at home probably will get more stress. Mm. Thank you, Neftali. Um, I think that the other thing that people tend to, you know, uh, question or, or to think about a lot is that the, the moment where you are most productive, uh, it's, kind of overlaps the moment if you're planning to have kids on your own. Uh, it, it, they, those times kind of overlap, which is like, uh, you know, after university, when you do the master, uh, it's, it's hard to decide or to even say that you have to do one thing or the other. Uh, coming back to what Amanda just said, like something like, uh, knowing that there are many, many uh, challenges for many people that, that actually cannot allow them to do that. But in, in the general uh, situation, how, how was it for you? Did you, did you feel that uh, barrier of, of having to be super productive while raising kids at any time? I think we are going in order, so I'm gonna start. <laughs> so, um, so I had the opportunity after uh, finishing my undergrad to have uh, in Ecuador to work for five years. So for me, like and back home, um, it's like it's very strict, like the work. There is not too many sick days. There is not too long of maternity leave. So I was used to, to that rhythm of like very strict schedule and then but back home you have family my mom will take care of my daughter so then we can leave her like in the best uh, hands but so when i came here like i didn't know very well the system so i thought uh, that was the way that you are supposed to be so i at the starting it was like daycare and then i would have like those time to work so i will drop her off they and then go to work to the office to classes so maybe it was a little bit of a different experience for me because i already came with a daughter so then when i had my second son was like an addition to it but i didn't like 
for me, I didn't have to think if I want to do this or I want to do that. Like I already came with a little package, so it was an easy decision. Yeah, I guess to answer the question, I um, I guess a lot of my friends in British Columbia don't have children, so I. Uh, I, I thought that in order to be a scientist, you had to be in the lab all the time and writing papers at home. And so um, I was very nervous, even, uh, you know, telling people at work the news that I was going to have a baby. But, uh, and then of course, as soon as it happens, you're like, oh my goodness, it's a whole world of people that have kids that are scientists or that are academics. So it's like, you don't know until you're in it uh, exactly how, how wonderful and, rich the world is you know i think parents find each other so um yeah once 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 you're in the club you're in the club i was going to comment that i had the opportunity to take at ubc a short course of time management so um i remember that we drove a, a curve uh, of uh, productivity in our daily lives so um, I guess for most of us, uh, our best time to work at home or to work with our uh, academic things is at, at the morning. In my case, it's at early in the morning. So because at the end of the day, you know, if you have uh, at least one kid, uh, physically you're tired. And at the end of the day, if you want to start studying at 11 p.m., you, you don't have like uh, that much energy to do it. So, uh, yeah, so I, I have learned to like go to bed early and wake up like earlier in, in the morning. And it's just about changing your, your routine. And uh, um, yeah, that's my case, I guess. Thank you. Um, I, I also wonder, you know, going locally uh, in the faculty of forestry, uh, was there anything that helped you as a parent? Uh, being as an a scholar and and if I can also ask you what you would like to have seen and you did not uh, so what what could be implemented maybe Fadi, if we can continue your proposal with the order so I did my master in the uh, land and food systems before agricultural science um, and then my PhD in forestry. I don't know if I have like a specific thing that I will say I, I like a specific in forestry. For me, the major issue was the availability and cost of take. So that is the major issue that um, that I think stops some people actually of having kids. If you want to keep like working or if you want to keep like uh, with grad school. Because at one point in our lives, uh, like my husband just finished grad school, so he started working and as like a first job in Canada, whatever it was, it was not that well paid, it was regular salary and I was still a grad student. And we pay our ma around like $1,800 per month of daycare. And we were lucky to have a spot for Alejandro and the UBC daycare. So, that kind of depleted our like kind of like our savings a little bit because for like almost a year my daughter was still uh, like after school care and then Alejandro as a baby because he started when he was eight months old because I was a grad student so I didn't have a maternity leave I just took uh, four months that was covered by my scholarship and then two more months like the six months of maternity leave. so it's not a specific of forestry, but I think it's a specific to UBC or like the province. Okay, locally in forestry, there's only one thing I can think of and that there, um, there is a breastfeeding room on the main floor, but it's always locked. So if anyone's out there that's listening, please, us mothers need somewhere to feed our babies. Unlock that room. Thank you. Well, no, in my case, I haven't had the opportunity to have my kids like uh, for a long time in, in, in Vancouver. So uh, basically I noticed that I have like uh, the time to make more progress on my dissertation 
when I'm when I am there, then when I'm here uh, working with them. So uh, I admire a lot uh, my wife and uh, all the women that are always like full time with the kids. And I think we have to make it like uh, or find more ways to share the responsibilities. I will only want to add that um, I think that we were lucky to to bring our daughters with us in a few field trips, and I felt a bit nervous about bringing that up um, with the with the professors. Uh, but at the end, it was a good call to be open, and 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 my daughters have been able to, you know, join some field trips in the faculty. And and I can I can I second uh, you know the need to keep opening spaces for parenting uh, for parenting practices uh, and and I also want to comment on on that on on the how lucky we are to have our kids working in a forest with people that have invested their life uh, doing research on trees. Um, I think that. If I'm not mistaken, Amanda, you have also moved from your uh, city uh, where, where you were raised. Um, so I, I'm interested on in knowing how it was for you all to move and parenting <laughs> and then, you know, becoming a parent because uh, there is a bit of uh, social isolation. Uh, and I know you've touched on this, but I, I'd like to know a little bit more. How did you cope at the end? Um, and I feel like I also would like to know specifically, how do you raise a kid when what they see in the house is so different of what they see outside the house? Um, so Fari. Okay, so, um, so as I say before, it's very difficult to come as a young mother without your mother. To guide you. So for me, uh, at the starting, as you say, you don't know. Uh, like I feel, we Latino families are a little bit more, a little bit more strict, a little bit more on top of the kids, and we do everything for them, which I've been readjusting. I told you about the nine years <laughs> I learned. Um, so. At the starting, it was very like very isolating, as you say. But I was lucky and I was blessed to live in Acadia, so the family housing. And then through the kids, uh, I found these other families, uh, Latino families, not specifically from Ecuador, but a lot of uh, Chilean families, Argentinian families that like it's the same like they are looking for somebody because this routine of like grad school and then the kids and dinner and school and dinner it can kill you like too like as a as a person right so then uh, having the friends around is the best thing that it can happen and for example in our case my husband will take always a uh, tuesday night and play soccer like everything can like fall apart but Tuesday night he would go and play soccer and then for me Thursday's night we go all the Latino mamas we were like around 10 or 12 and have coffee at the dinner like every week so that was our outlet like even uh, it was 9 30 so the kids were sleeping already so that's something that I really really recommend uh, like new parents is to create your support network especially if you don't have your extended family here uh, create your support network so you as an adult also can share something else um, but it's been difficult because now that i have an adult daughter sometimes i like we fight as in every family and i say no but it's because we are latinos that's why we're, we are here and she is like no mom I'm not, I'm, I'm Canadian, like she was raised here, right? So she has to adapt like to the different cultures too, but she, she thinks of herself as a Canadian, which is very good, but it's something that you like with many years start to be adjusted. I think. 
Ooh, yeah, that's uh, very true. Um, I don't know. I'm still a new parent and I feel like I haven't done everything I should to develop my network because I often feel isolated. Um, especially during COVID, like I just, my daughter would see other kids in the mall and like run after them. And I'm like, no, no, you're not allowed to go close to them. So it's hard for me to see that she wants to be with other kids. And um, I think I'm going to take Farida's advice on this one. And uh, just, I, I, I need to further develop my support network here because uh, you just, you see how necessary it is for survival. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to comment that, uh, as I said before, I move continuously from Mexico to Vancouver and, and back. Um, so I try to make sure that my wife has some family support from our extended family, from my side, from her side when, when I'm not here. Uh, so she has the help to, uh, I mean, for daily homework and uh, it's it's still difficult because it's not the same thing as being here. But um, I I I'm grateful because she she's willing to pay the cost for me for uh, going and coming back because of my PhD. And um, but I think uh, in terms of uh, social isolation, we don't have like a lot of problem because we are surrounded by. Uh, our extended families. You know, in, in the case of Latino families, we are like big families. So we have a big network. And, um, but um, I think we, we still have to improve the way we communicate with each other when we are uh, separated because sometimes we don't realize what is really going on at home. I, uh, I will say just that. Thank you so much all. I, I just want to add something. I feel like sometimes the support network not necessarily needs to be, um, you know, people that are parenting. The support network can be a soccer uh, club or a karaoke, you know. Um, I, I, I just want to, to offer that too. Uh, because I, I tend to feel that once we become parents, it's almost like if we were quitting all, all the other uh, labels or identities that we carry with us and, and not necessarily, is that, that's not necessarily the case, but just adding another layer, but we don't need to quit on the other. Maybe it's just the other groups that are more different than us can, can gain a lot having us close to them and, and you know, it goes to both sides like that. So I, I want to remind everyone to post uh, questions in the Q&A box. Uh, Hishan and Sara both will help us to collate them. And I have the first question from the audience, and this is, it's easy sometimes to have being a parent take over life outside of work. Any ideas on how to keep time for yourself and the energy to pursue your interests outside work and kids? Okay, so that's a very good question, and I think it's everybody's right. So it, it happened to me, um, like I think Alejandro was maybe maybe one or two, and I need to do something else because, like, work you work all day, then you come home, but I need to do something else. So I decided to start running, and since then I've been like. I have had run like few marathons and now uh, I actually coordinate the sun running clinic. So I know it's like put more like responsibilities on you, but that feels you so much. Uh, you just like, if you have to run at six in the morning, you run at six in the morning because there is no other time. But that's another thing. You have to find things that work for you, not things that are too scheduled at the starting. Later you can like, like I know Estefania loves dancing salsa and I always say, oh, I'm gonna join you, I'm gonna join your club, but sometimes it doesn't work. So for me, running was my outlet and I feel kind of, um, and now I'm responsible for people to start running. So that fills me up a lot. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think I, I'm, my daughter's two, so I think I'm at the point where, yes, I need to start my hobbies again. <laughs> so uh, I really like gardening. I can plunk her outside and she'll play while I garden. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm still in the very, very 
I feel like she just was a baby like yesterday. And so now I'm kind of like coming up for air and <laughs> yeah, hobbies. Yes, I like that idea. I'm going to comment that uh, it's hard to have a separate time for uh, us uh, as we are almost devoted for our kids. But uh, if you have a hobby, like uh, I like to play some uh, music and I like to do some exercise like biking most of the time. So I like to combine this time with them, take them to do some exercise with the bikes or uh, get them to play with me. And uh, that makes me happy too. And uh, also if I have to do uh, something that requires me time just for myself, uh, I talk with my couple and, and I, told, I, I tell her, uh, can you look after them and, and maybe later on you can do the same thing so I can be in charge. And uh, we exchange like the time and the responsibilities. So I think that works some, sometimes, <laughs> most of the time. Thank you so much. Um... We have a comment. Great initiative, Farida, Amanda, and Nestali. Thanks for sharing your experiences. Please keep sending questions and in the quick Q and A section. Uh, while you do that, um, and some, I, I just want to add that sometimes it's not having a very structured hobby. Sometimes it's just having a book that you will read ten times slower than the rest. You know, uh, but uh, the other thing that I've I've noticed is that. I do a lot of crafts. So when I do embroidery, for example, and I see the progress, that makes me feel like a better person, like, like a better independent person, because I can see the progress. So I can see that I devoted time to myself and myself only. Um, so what, uh, what do you think that happens when, you know, you are starting to, to raise a kid and you are very open to get feedback from people around you. It could be mom, dad, or grandparents, or caregivers. Uh, how do you deal with the very necessary support that you can get having feedback, but at the same time risking to hear something that might be, you know, going against um, your type of parenting or your values? Uh, I don't know if any of you have been in that case, uh, but if you have, or if you think of that, how would you deal with the, we can call it unsolicited advice or, or, a, or something like along those lines? <laughs> but I feel <laughs> uh, here in Canada, uh, like people uh, are more private. So, Maybe back home for sure you deal with unsolicited advice because we live with our extended families and we share a lot. But here, I don't think it has happened to me that somebody tell me like, or maybe like it's some like if Alejandro is like when he was a kid, like trying to mask or something. But I I don't feel I never had to deal with that specific. But. I'm usually a no a confrontational person. So in my case, I will hear, acknowledge that I hear what they say and then just move on. Because what you can control is how you feel about what they say, not what they say. Right, so that would be my. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten some pretty crazy advice, but uh, I usually just smile and nod. <laughs> I, I like, I like the piece of advice is that, and I hear it all the time, they're only young once, enjoy every minute. And uh, I always think of that because as, PhD, as a PhD student, I can be preoccupied with my project, but that doesn't, it's, you know, I'm, I'm losing time with her. So I should always remember uh, to be present with her when I'm, when I'm with her. Okay, I will say that uh, here in our culture, we listen to respectfully to everyone, you know, a lot of advice, but at the end of the day, you decide uh, what, what is the advice uh, to apply. And uh, we have decided uh, with my wife that uh, we listen more to the caregivers or to the kindergarten teachers, 
because they spend a lot of the, their time with our kids and um, at the end of the day, they, they know more our kids and, and they are, most of them, they are professionals. Um, and we think they can give us valuable um, elements to incorporate in our daily routines too. Thank you so much. We, uh, we have a few questions from the audience. Given all have family elsewhere, how to maintain connection between their kids and their extended family elsewhere? Mm. Well, I think maybe I have failed a little bit on that one because um, like I call my mom every other day when I walk from my house to the building. So I know what is happening in Ecuador. But I feel because of the, like, it's not correct, of course, but I feel because of a rush of like weekend soccer or like, uh, we connect with my parents, like in special occasions, not usually. And that's, that is specific what it helps so much. It's like, my parents not knowing my kids and my kids, like thinking of the grandparents back home as like, a, I don't know, like, they don't know them. But I was like, we are also lucky enough to have my husband's uh, parents living close to us. So they live here in British Columbia and they, they have a relationship with them. So that is a little bit of a balance. Yeah, my, my, uh, my family all has Google Hangouts. So every day I can look at it and at least there's pictures of Millie's extended family but it's it's not the same as her actually playing with her little cousins so i usually visit once a year and we're you know we call each other but uh yeah i know that's what it is right yeah i guess we don't have like a lot of choice <laughs> uh, we only have to use technology you know when we're having our uh, FaceTime or WhatsApp uh, video calls. And uh, uh, in our case, we still have the opportunity to visit each other, always taking care, like in this pandemic uh, time, you know, it sucks <laughs> to visit uh, some uh, family and always taking care of, uh, you know, the basic rules now you have to look after. So um, yeah, I think we don't have like a lot of choice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there is a question that is related to many in academia, not necessarily in forestry. Have you seen any good initiatives for parents from any professional scientific societies? Mm. Well, lately I have, uh, I, I have never used it, but I have uh, heard that some of the societies provide baker in conferences. So that's a good one. Um, what I was reading like today too, that I was doing some research is that for example, in, I don't remember which one's the university, like the grad, uh, like the grad, is, the grad faculty, faculty of grad st studies provide like support for like matters. So, that one is something that I haven't here in here. Like grad studies has a lot of programs for like uh, development, professional development, but no specific for like parents. So maybe that would be a good idea. Yeah, exactly. I remember during the early days of COVID, um, AMS or GS, GPS had a Dis a panel discussion for parents, which I participated in, but it was just like a one hour thing. I don't know. No, I've never heard of uh, professional. Like, what do you mean, though, Estefania? Like, what kind of things have you heard of? I, I've seen what Faride mentioned, like having childcare or sometimes when you register to a conference uh, from any society and they have at the end, we realize that some speakers might need to bring their child with them, let us know if you need any further accommodation. Um, I feel like just making this very visible 
um, that that's how I am interpreting um, the question. But if I'm doing that wrong, please uh, clear, give us some more context. But I feel like it was targeting some of that. Some societies have been quite progressive and others don't. Oh, that's a great thing. Yeah. Yeah, in my case, I haven't heard something like that, probably because I, I haven't looked for it. But uh, I remember when my wife came to stay for a season here, I mean, there in Vancouver, and uh, we were living uh, close to a, a family family place i think it was called so we received some uh, professional support from them and you know for learning or improving english uh, having the kids for uh, some hours and playing with them it's just basically entertainment but uh, we feel some support from them and from the side of the university i haven't looked for any support Thank you. Yes, um, we we wanted to ask you also if you know about any financial support given by UBC or any other source. Um, I think Neftali addressed this now, but or any other source for grad students that want to take parental leave for a few months, given that this doesn't work for fellowships. So you can provide some more. Details I, on that. Like I, I graduated 2012, so maybe I'm a little bit outdated. But I, just two years before I had my son in my PhD, Enser uh, put this new four-month uh, parental leave. So I was lucky enough to have that. So I have four months from Enser of support. But I'm totally outdated. I, yeah, I graduated 2012. Maybe Amanda knows more. Yeah, I think I got four months answer uh, leave, parental leave. Yeah, I just read uh, Sarah Gurgil wrote on the chat section that uh, the UBC uh, have some funds for uh, caregiver funds. So if anyone is interested, you can take a look of it. Yes, as, as Neptali mentioned, uh, UBC Faculty of Forestry, Matches, and CERC, which is a funding agency in Canada, uh, parental leave funding for everyone. And the Faculty of Forestry has $500 caregiver funds. Um, I, I was one of the first that got the parental leave. Uh, you know, this is a special program that the faculty wanted to implement, uh, which is uh, you know, not only financial support, but also having a bit more of flexibility for parents. Um, so if people want to know more, um, they can look up for this information or just send us an email. Um, we are coming close to the end. So um, I would like to ask you, uh, all of you, how is for your child or for, for your uh, children, I think we lost uh, Amanda, but we are going to continue with this question while she connects again. Uh, how is for your children to have a parenting academia? Is, I'm going to repeat. How is uh, for your children to have a parent in academia? Does that is that abstract, or how, how do you how do your kids talk about you? I am the the tree scientist uh, for my kid and her friends. Do you have any funky name assigned? to you? Well, that, that I think is one of the, um, like the things that pushed me through grad school because when I graduated from my master, I was crossing this, at that point, the master actually crossed the stage and my daughter uh, like screamed from like in the chant center, my mom, and everybody laughed. So. I think they see you as like uh, achieve your goals. And that's very important. Like even like it's for your, like for your personal growth, this degree, but you are guiding, they are looking at everything that they you, that you do on you, that you do. So if they see you like struggling and like working hard for your degree, they, that is also what they are gonna do for when they have to do 
any, any goals that they are going to set up for themselves. So um, sometimes my daughter bags my husband, actually, that I am the doctor. <laughs> Uh, too young. She doesn't really uh, understand yet. Yeah, uh, my kids, um, probably the oldest, realizes that I'm doing something always with the computer. And especially when I'm doing some TA activities, she asks me, like, uh, what are you doing? Are you teaching or something like that? Yeah, something like that. So I answer and, and she says, and, uh, are you spoiling or are you very strict with your uh, students? And so I used to spoil them, but uh, sometimes not necessary. And, but she gets some ideas. She's like building some ideas in her mind about what is to be a professor or something like that in the university level. And uh, that's what I'm really wanted to do after finishing my PhD. So I, th I, I think I'm gonna keep that idea in her mind. Perfect. So we have uh, two comments from the Q&A. The Ecological Society of America has childcare in their annual meetings. Lots of women in ecology. And there is a word of encouragement from the Q&A. As my, as my kid, kids got older, I moved from to-do list to ta-da list from, um, of accomplishment. Uh, sorry, that gave me more of a sense of accomplishment Panels are accomplishing an awful lot, but if we don't take time to reflect on it, we remain unaware and frustrated. So having have uh, some moments, uh, perhaps before going to bed, uh, to think of what you do. Um, and to close, I have a last question. I know that not everyone here might celebrate, but um, just wondering if your kids are going to get dressed up for Halloween or Dia de los Muertos. Um, so if you can share with us that and, and perhaps uh, 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 then we will end up with a closing remarks from each one of you. So this morning I woke up really early because I had to do the Terminator makeup for my son. Yeah, she was already trick-or-treating. Uh, really, she was a ducky. You were a ducky for Halloween. Say hi to everybody. Uh, yes, so that's what we were. She actually got a huge bag of candy. Nice. So um, right now, as I told you, in Oaxaca, Mexico, so it, this is a big place to celebrate the Day of the Dead. <laughs> So um, yeah, it's quite different from uh, Halloween, but uh, yeah, as one special thing here in Mexico is to build some kind of altars to honor or to remember the uh, our uh, family that already passed away. And um, we are having some special food, like uh, we call it here tamales and, and, and atole, which is uh, made of uh, corn and also um, chocolate. So I think uh, it's a way for them to learn how to celebrate here in our uh, local culture. But also, they also like are getting influence from uh, all these uh, Halloween customs that are coming from the States or somewhere else. Thank you all for sharing this. And to close, I would just uh, like to ask you uh, to share a message to those um, that are attending to this webinar or that might see this video afterwards. Any reflections around this topic? Mm, the only thing that I want to say is that um, try to find the balance uh, and take care of yourself too. Okay, uh, I got to say that I mean, although uh, I don't have family here, that my godmother in Vancouver will take care of her when I'm in the lab. And so I've got to say thank you because, um, you know, we find, we find a network and I'm incredibly thankful for no! it. Hey, you should be thankful too. Uh, that no! Incredibly thankful yes, because no! uh, at who we have no! in, our, in our lives to, uh, to, <laughs> to, to make things work. 
Yeah, thank you. I, I just want to say that <clears throat> sometimes I get frustrated because uh, the lack of productivity in my thesis or something like that. But at the end of the day, um, I also get realized that, uh, as I said before, many of my expectations or my paradigms have changed about parenting. And that's something that I'm happy for because uh, I feel that also my couple, my wife, she's, she's happy with me having uh, support for the things that she needs because she also works as professional. So we have to always think as a team and uh, being a team uh, will get us to uh, better goals or to the goals that we have uh, planned. So yeah, that's, that's all. Well, thank you to the three of you. I think that uh, you've uh, shared very, very important insights on how to parent and how to take care of ourselves. And I feel like closing with what Neftali just said, like teamwork is needed. Um, being that with your family, friends, uh, caregivers uh, that you find. And yeah, so for all of that, we, we would like to thank you. And I also want to thank someone, uh, someone, uh, two people actually, that uh, Hisham and Sara, they both have an active role in equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism initiatives. And it's thanks to them that we are here. So I want to close with that um, message of gratitude to them. Thank you and have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.